The path to World War I, the factors that created the war that no one actually wanted. There are a lot of ways to categorize the things that actually started the war, um, and this is my version of it. So there are a number of key factors that do cause the thing to happen, and in order of how I think they influence the war, they are as follows. First, nationalism. Second, imperialism. Third, technology. Fourth, militarism. And finally, alliances. So nationalism is the first and most influential factor in my mind as to why World War I broke out. So after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, nationalism came to define Europe. And so France, which of course led the Napoleonic Wars, had dominated Europe. Um, it was a nationalistic nation and it was feared by its neighbors. So that was obviously a pressure that was felt by everyone in Europe. Ethnic minorities within the Austro-Hungarian Empire also sometimes desired nationhoods, and to some extent that was caused by Napoleon and the French as they invaded Austria-Hungary, but one way or another there were ethnic minority nationalist pressures within Austria-Hungary that led into World War I. And then you had two nations that formed that uh, kind of destabilized Europe, the Europe that had formed after Napoleon, which had been fairly balanced. There had been a balance of power, and that changed with the arrival of two new large nations in the middle of Europe in Central Europe although Italy is technically in Southern Europe. Germany is in Central Europe. So Italy formed in 1861, and that's like finally sort of formed. It was a process and it actually isn't completed until later, but it does form in 1861 and it disturbs what's called the concert of Europe mildly because Italy is a pretty small country and not overly influential compared to say Germany or France or the United Kingdom or Russia. In 1871, Germany forms, and that's a major and basically fatal disturbance of the balance of power that was the concert of Europe. And then directly related to the rise of World War I, um, or the outbreak of World War I, is the rise of the small country uh, called Serbia in the Balkans, which is a peninsula I'll show you on a map here in a minute. Um, and Serbia, which formed in 1878, alongside a whole bunch of other uh, Balkan nations, uh, also disturbed the local balance of power in the Balkan Peninsula. All right, so this is a map of Europe in 1815, right after the end of uh, the Napoleonic Wars. And this is basically the nations that are seen as being part of the concert of Europe. So when a whole bunch of Euro European nations were pretty equally balanced and able to, if not work together collaboratively, at least balance each other out to the point where they didn't fight a lot because each of them was fairly evenly balanced and therefore war was pretty risky. And so this map does show you what life looked like before things began to be unstable in the 19th century. So you have big Austrian empire, which controls large parts of Northern Italy. You have this big sloppy and confusing thing I'm not gonna explain because I explained that in a previous lecture called the German Confederation, which is a whole series of small states, uh, Prussia being the biggest one, which is eventually gonna be the root state of Germany, the French, the the Russians, Great Britain, and very importantly, the Ottoman Empire. So these were the nations that would be destabilized over the course of the 19th century, breaking the concert of Europe and therefore leading to the alliance system that will be a big part of World War I. This map shows the uh, ethnic minorities in Austria-Hungary that I was talking about. So Austria-Hungary was a kind of old school kingdom back from like monarchical days, and it had married and conquered its way to control a very large area back when that was a thing you did. And as a result, it had a whole lot of ethnic minorities, uh, different languages, different cultures, different religions, and that put a lot of nationalist pressure on Austria-Hungary. So you can see all of these various colors are people who really did see themselves as uh, nations effectively, or began to see themselves as nations. So it looked to all the neighbors of Austria-Hungary as if this was a country that could easily fall apart. And there were certainly ethnic minorities within this country who wanted Austria-Hungary to fall apart in, so that they could get their own nations, thus nationalism. And so Austria-Hungary was kind of fragile, uh, and there was always the possibility that this country would uh, shatter. And that was a problem that would lead up to World War I. There were a ton of people in Austria-Hungary, however, who did want to keep it together. Um, and they felt like they could create kind of a United States of Austria-Hungary thing, or at least find a way to work together. And they also understood that there was unity, uh, power in unity. And so it's not like Austria-Hungary was just a time bomb waiting to go off, but it definitely had problems in a nationalist time period with a very large number of ethnic minorities with nationalist sentiments.
I mentioned Italy, so here's a map and you can see what it kind of looks like. So it took a while for the King of Italy, uh, starting up in the north, uh, Sardinia Piedmont, to actually unite all of what we now think of as modern Italy. And that all of these little states were eventually put together by 1861. Germany is very similar, although way more influential because Germany became a much bigger country. And a lot of these little states that you see that come together to be modern Germany were already very wealthy and well-developed states. So when you put them all together, you suddenly have this big, powerful, industrialized country in the middle of Europe. And that is really what shattered any hope that the concert of Europe, the equal balance of states, would maintain itself. And so the rise of Germany, which was a lovely thing for the Germans, uh, and in no way bad, and remember, the Nazis don't yet exist. So this isn't like the evil Germans, it's just like the totally reasonable, nice Germans who wanted a Germany for the Germans, which is not a bad thing. Um, but it was a bad thing for Europe. So this is Serbia, the little country that could start World War I. Um, it is a country that formed in the Balkans out of the ruins of the Ottoman Empire's European possessions. And it was next to Romania and Bulgaria and Greece. I'll show you this again and highlight the Balkans later. But basically it had a very small little country that formed to the south of Austria-Hungary and was, as you can see, surrounded with no access to the sea, which made trade difficult. And the Serbs were very aggressive, very nationalistic, and there were Serbian minorities sort of all around them, or at least the Serbs believed there were Serbian minorities. Some of the people who the Serbs claimed as minorities didn't see themselves as Serbian. Um, but Serbia was a nationalist country that wanted to expand. And in the end, this would be the country that's in many, many ways sparked World War I, although it actually wins World War I in some ways. All right, and enough with the maps for a moment. Um, another crucial uh, pressure for World War I was the race for imperial colonies throughout the world um, that pitted Europeans against each other. So um, as much as the Europeans were trying to figure out how to live side by side, they were also in their acts of imperialism, which we studied in the last unit, uh, actually a couple of last units, um, those very aggressive and inevitably tinged by racist uh, desires to build nationalist or imperial possessions throughout the planet, which basically trashed uh, Africa and Asia in a very significant way, um, were uh, a huge pressure also towards World War One. So Great Britain, which of course, you know, given what uh, we studied earlier, had built this enormous world empire, was seen as a very overwhelming competitor by all of its uh, neighbors. The French were competitive with the British, the Germans were, everyone was. So Great Britain on its little island was kind of smugly looking down at the rest of Europe and that bugged the rest of Europe. The British, of course, were like, hey, we built this empire and we're helping all these people, which of course they weren't. Um, but uh, that pressure about uh, the British lead in imperialism would feed into the pressures within Europe itself. France was in second place. Uh, that put them in tension with the British and also everybody below the French in terms of how many possessions they had um, was uh, problematic. Germany and Italy, the new countries I just showed you, uh, those countries were like, why don't we get empires? You guys already took all the, all the places that could be common. So, like, you should give some to us, which, of course, the French and the British disagreed with. Um, and, you know, nobody obviously was asking Asian and uh, African people whether they wanted to be part of an empire, but that's an issue we covered earlier. Um, Japan, which was a rising industrial state, wanted also into the imperial game, and that put them into tension with all of the European states. And that was a, a minor, although significant element in World War I. And particularly because Russia and Japan were bouncing up against each other in their imperial race uh, to control Korea, Mongolia, and northern China. And that put Japan into the mix for World War I as a possible ally or a possible person who would distract the country by fighting in Asia while they were at risk in Europe. This map something we looked at in the last unit, uh, or maybe the last units, depending on which order I do this next year. Um, so this shows you the, the dismantling of Africa or the creation of uh, European imperial possessions within Africa. And so this really was pretty much a race. Uh, people wanted to control Africa and the Germans and the Italians didn't have a lot of it. And particularly, although they do have some colonies, you can see here, um, they weren't uh, the influential and wealthy places. And so therefore they felt like it was unfair to them and that they were going to fall behind France and England, um, more importantly than any other thing, that they felt that um, without imperial possessions, they'd be in a lot of trouble. And this is the, what Africa looked like as part of that race for imperial possessions 
And here, of course, is imperialism in Asia, uh, and you see a kind of similar thing with, uh, you don't see any Germany or Italy here at all. Uh, eventually, the Germans do begin to participate in the, dis in the trashing of China. Um, but, you know, European states other than Italy and Germany had huge empires, um, and that created tensions within Europe, particularly the British, because they controlled the enormous and incredibly wealthy state uh, of India or subcontinent, uh, the Indian subcontinent at this time, and that put a lot of pressure on everybody else. And here you can see the Russians and the, and the Japanese bouncing up against each other, creating a lot of pressure uh, and making the Russians worried that they were going to have to fight a war with the Japanese while they might also be fighting a war with the Germans or the Austro-Hungarians. And this is a topic I'll go to go into in a little more depth in another lecture, but technology was also a kind of subtle subcurrent to the problem of the rise of World War I, mostly because people didn't really anticipate the impacts of the new technologies and therefore failed to anticipate how war how bad the war would be. Um, so obviously um, weapons had developed rapidly since the, since the Napoleonic Wars as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So there were machine guns, there were uh, you know, howitzers and cannons and very quality explosives and uh, the beginning of aircraft and things like that. And, and those new military tools meant that it was difficult for a lot of militaries to really gather how well the next war would go and how even it would look. And they desperately uh, failed to anticipate what would actually happen. Um, and a lot of militaries were honestly kind of thinking about like, you know, I mean, not like generals are bad people, because uh, usually they are, you know, people who want to, patriotic people who want to defend their stuff. But on the other hand, you give a general some nice toys, uh, he might want to play with them. Um, and even more importantly, generals will think that if the other country has those new toys, they need to be extremely worried about them. Um, and so you do sometimes get aggressive and disturbing generals, and you definitely had those generals before World War I. But you also had generals who were totally reasonable people who understood what these weapons could do, but who were terrified of the fact that the other countries had those weapons. Um, and so in order to feel safe, countries and also on the aggressive side to be able to conquer territories and build colonies uh, as part of the race for imperialism, um, Europeans began to compete to build newer and better and larger quantities of weapon. Those arms races ratcheted up the tension, increased the tension in Europe, and made it so that it was very difficult for countries after a certain point to stop overbuilding their militaries because the other guy was. And this is a defensive thing. You're not building militaries to necessarily at this point to try and kill the other guy. You're just so afraid of the other guy that you need to build your military, which makes them build their military, and it just spiraled out of control in Europe, particularly in the naval race. Um, and then the other thing that is kind of an interesting one is improved transportation networks. Things like railroads uh, and steamships and things like that just increase the speed at which war could happen. If you think about like the Napoleonic Wars, um, you know, if you started a war in Europe to get your army even to the border to invade the other country might take a month, six weeks. Uh, it was very hard to like snap start a war. And therefore, people had time to talk a war down. They could meet with each other, they could debate, their, their, their tensions could go down, they could, you know, they could get their acts together before it turned into a war. With railroads and steamships, militaries could be on site very quickly. Uh, by the beginning of 1914, uh, it was down to some cases in terms of the French and the Germans inside of 36 to 48 hours, which meant that there was no time to talk. Like you literally knew that if you didn't mobilize, get your army together and get it in place immediately, the other guy might beat your troops to the border and therefore win the war before you were even in place. So transportation technologies really did ratchet up the tension. Uh, it's kind of like today when, you know, if given the, the rise of nuclear weapons and the incredible speed with which we could kill instantaneously, probably about a sixth of the entire human population, we really if you are the president of the United States or any nuclear armed nation, have maybe 15 minutes to decide whether or not to kill 100 million, maybe a billion people. Um, there is no time left to think. That was something that had happened before World War I that they did not notice. They thought they had more time than they did. The generals knew they didn't, but the politicians thought they could talk. Um, and that was a mistake. Uh, and then 
the similar and uh, kind of uh, connected part of that has to do with things like telegraph and the radio, which also made the speed of war faster. Um, you could tell people to get to the train, to get to the border uh, way faster than they possibly could. And so communications technologies um, made things, again, even more dangerous. And no one really noticed that. Um, they they kind of had a sense things were very different, but they had nothing in place to deal with these problems. Um, we have tried to deal with those uh, issues, but we still do face them in the world today. Um, we have very little time to think before we act, um, even less time than they had before World War I. And then a very common uh, critique of why World War One happened would be the rise of militarism. And militarism was very popular. And militarism is just love of your love of your military and a belief that the military is a is an excellent tool for the nation and things like that. A glorification of military power and soldiers and things like that. Um, it can be sometimes just patriotism. Um, and especially in newly independent countries, militarism is is pretty uh, common. And I don't think it's always bad, although I definitely am an anti-militarist. Um, but as a side effect of nationalism, particularly those those nation building wars, militaries and war in general were extremely uh, well seen or, or seen very positively in uh, the period leading up to World War One. And of course, being militaristic makes a war more likely. Uh, this is also still, you know, when men ruled. Uh, it was a masculine dominated society at this time throughout Europe. Um, and as a result, like war was seen more positively because many men, who many of them had gone to war, uh, in smaller wars, not World War I, believed that the military was a ma way to make you a man. Um, and so, you know, that really was a concept that helped lead people into World War I, you know, you had a whole generation of young men who wanted to be men. And so war, uh, to some extent, does come out of that theory. Uh, that's kind of a subcategory of masculinism uh, or a militarism that's just masculinism. Um, and it is important, however, to realize that before World War I, there were a ton of people who knew this. Uh, you know, the communist movements, socialist movements did not even believe it, particularly in the nation state. They thought it was a capitalist trick uh, to make people fight with each other, which I don't actually fully disagree with. Um, and uh, there were also strong pacifist movements who felt like, you know, the, the weapons were too terrifying and they shouldn't be used. Um, and you also had people who basically just felt like war was stupid and not worth the money, uh, that, you know, Europe was too interconnected with trade and all this other stuff. And why would anyone risk that money? I mean, everyone's getting rich. The Industrial Revolution's going on. Why do you need to fight? Um, the problem was that those movements were not strong enough. And nationalism and militarism and all the other stuff I've been talking about would, in, in the end, overwhelm a significant but not powerful enough anti-war uh, movement. And then, of course, there's the, the alliance system. Uh, defensive alliances had come to dominate Europe. So when Germany and Italy popped into the middle of Europe, um, you suddenly had that idea of the concert of Europe, the balance of power that had made things safe-ish for everybody in Europe go away. Um, and as a result, in a defensive and kind of actually quite nice and reasonable uh, way of dealing with things, the European nations decided to form alliances so that they could you know, feel safe, like, and they basically divvied up Europe into alliance structures that were not meant to attack other countries. They were meant to keep you safer. So all the stuff I was just talking about, like getting rich and uh, conquering other people, which of course is a bad sign, but, um, you know, from their point of view, this was a, a good defensive kind of thing. Um, the Ottoman Empire, which was at this point in a lot of trouble for a lot of reasons that have been covered in earlier units, um, was falling apart. And that created problems too, because nobody was quite sure where the Ottoman Empire should fit into the alliance. Um, both people in both alliances were thinking of taking parts of the Ottoman Empire. So that kind of brushed these new alliances up against each other. So the decline of the Ottoman Empire's power uh, was problematic. And um, the other things I've already covered, so I will just leave it uh, as that. And then the alliances actually were the Triple Entente versus the Triple Alliance. Um, the Triple Entente was made up of France, the United Kingdom, and Russia. The Triple Alliance is made up of Germany, Austria-Hungary, and Italy. Germany and Austria-Hungary uh, share at least partially the language of German. Uh, France and the United Kingdom were democracies, although Russia definitely wasn't. But the French needed the Russians to counter the Germans. That was a weird alliance. Um, Triple Alliance was also weird because the Germans had stolen a bunch of Austria-Hungary to become Germany, and the Italians they're the Italians. You love them, but they're not the toughest country on the planet. So they were just kind of stuck on so that there would be three on three. Um, and these two sides, these two pairs were roughly balanced. But obviously, if you have these two big blocks 
of countries you know facing off against each other that raises some risks of paranoia you're going to worry the other alliance is bigger than your alliance and then you got to have an arms race um and since they are broken into two blocks you have a kind of permanent antagonism baked into the system they don't like each other necessarily they're constantly preparing for war against each other and that it's not a good recipe for for a positive outcome and here's the map of what uh, the alliance system looks like. So you can see the triple alliance here in the middle, these three countries. Um, and then you can see the triple entente on the side here in red. This map shows you how it actually broke down uh, when the war started. The Ottoman Empire, uh, which would eventually become Turkey, would join uh, the what became the Central Powers. Italy switched sides. They did not fight on the side of the Triple Alliance. Uh, they they first said, no, we don't want to join the war at all. And then eventually they joined the Triple Entente because they wanted part of Austria-Hungary. So interestingly, the alliance system actually didn't fully end up being the um, exact sides in the war itself. So to review the factors that led to World War I, a war that no one wanted, here we go. Um, so World War I, you know, like I said, nobody really wanted. They built defensive alliances. They got a lot of weapons to defend themselves. They tried to build their nations. And really, everybody kind of understood, like, this isn't a thing we should do. I mean, some of the countries did think, like, we might be ready for a war later, so we should prepare for it. But there wasn't anybody in 1914, really, who wanted a war in terms of whole nations. There were definitely groups, uh, some very aggressive groups within Serbia, uh, within Germany, within Russia, who did consider a war. Um, but for the most part, nobody wanted it. And it happened anyway, which is what makes World War one so terrifying. This is the war we could easily repeat uh, because the mistakes that were made leading up to World War I are the exact same things we do today. And it it is a much more likely kind of massive conflict for us to engage in. World War II is weird. It's more of a freak show. World War I is average people trying to do good things in a defensive and reasonable way. And most of us would have felt very comfortable in 1913 if we were male and straight and all that stuff. Um, so you have nationalism, which can be a very good thing. You know, build your country, enjoy your independence and freedom. Um, on the other hand, that can often feel very aggressive and threatening to the nations around you. You have imperialism, um, and imperialism is obviously, I think, a bad thing. Uh, and the imperialistic race between the European countries not only harmed Africans, Asians, Latin Americans, everybody else, but it also very seriously harmed themselves because that race led to World War I. Technology is const a constant problem, and in this situation, technology had created all kinds of new rules um, that unfortunately nobody actually fully understood, and that made the war that they were stumbling into something they wouldn't have stumbled into had they actually understood the technological implications of what was about to happen. Militarism, I think, is clearly a bad thing in this situation. Um, you know, Overwhelming love for your military ain't going to help you stay out of a war. And then alliances are actually a nice thing and good and useful and all that business. But in this case, those alliance blocks, especially when you add in a couple of secret treaties between the Russians and the Serbs uh, and some understandings between various other countries, um, those things in, ed in the end made what started out as a fairly small event, uh, basically a crime, explodes into, as a result of all of these things coming together, the largest war the world had yet seen, the rise of World War I. Thank you.